The Governance of China, Volume 2, Audiobook, Part 18. When the people are firm in their convictions, the nation will flourish. February 28th, 2015. Main points of the speech at Xi's meeting with representatives to the Fourth Conference of National Model Cities, Towns, Villages, and Units for Cultural Progress and Model Ethical Tutors for Minors. When the people are firm in their convictions, the country will prosper and the nation will grow stronger. To realize the Chinese dream of national rejuvenation, we must be wealthy in both material and cultural terms, and we must be consistent and persistent in our pursuit of socialist, cultural, and ethical progress, and in providing all the people with a strong ideological guarantee, intellectual support, and moral sustenance. Soon after the adoption of reform and opening up in 1978, the party took on the strategic task of promoting socialist, cultural, and ethical progress and adopted the strategic concept of pushing for material progress on the one hand and cultural and ethical progress on the other, with great importance attached to both. Over more than 30 years, the Chinese people have not only worked a miracle of material progress, but reaped the great benefit of cultural and ethical progress, during which a large number of outstanding role models, of whom you are representatives, have come to the fore. The people of a country or a nation must have common ideals and convictions if they are to advance with aspiration. We should constantly and thoroughly promote socialism with Chinese characteristics within the party and throughout society, advocate the themes of the times, encourage healthy trends, enhance the belief in our path, theory, and system, and let the beacon of ideals and convictions blaze in the heart of every person in China. We should stick to this strategic concept deal with the relationship between material progress and cultural and ethical progress in a dialectical, comprehensive, and balanced way, pursue cultural and ethical progress in all aspects of social life in our reform, opening up, and modernization, and at the same time cultivate and practice core socialist values and encourage our communists to develop a sound world outlook, view of life, and values, and remain convicted to the communist ideals. We should enhance our social, professional, family, and individual ethics. We should create an an environment where ethics are held in high esteem. We should endeavor to promote Chinese traditions, improve party conduct, the working practices of government officials, social morality, and family traditions, and let the Chinese cultural genes multiply, especially among young people. All officials, public figures, and role models should play an exemplary role in setting up the concept of cultural and ethical progress, striving to be model citizens of civil conduct and presenting a good image. Cultural and ethical progress can only play a bigger role when we stand in the forefront of the times and set the standards of social morality and trends. At present, the minds of our people are active. All kinds of concepts collide with each other, and new technologies and new media, such as the Internet, develop with each passing day. All of this requires us to assess and take advantage of the situation and bring more vitality to cultural and ethical progress through innovation in the contents and carriers, and by improving the ways and means. We must achieve solid results through a down-to-earth approach in promoting cultural and ethical progress. 
which should center on improving the people's well-being. We should fight against going through the motions and excessive bureaucracy and endeavor to meet the rising cultural needs of the people. Party committees at all levels should fulfill their duties and do their best to promote cultural and ethical progress. Uphold and consolidate the party's ideological leadership. May 18th, 2015 to May 17th, 2016. Excerpts from speeches made between May 18th 2015 and May 17th, 2016. Section 1. The rapid development of the internet has seen the emergence of two groups of people, new media professionals and social media opinion leaders. Of the two, the former run online media and the latter voice their opinions. Both groups are powerful enough to influence online discussions. As I have observed before, cyberspace is a major domain for publicity, thus a focus of competition. Therefore, we must take the initiative in this field and win over these two groups. To this end, we should work to enlist the most prominent figures among them in the united front establish regular contact strengthen online and offline interaction and seek a common political understanding from the speech at the central conference on the united front may 18th 2015 section 2 the premise of party schools identifying themselves with the party is upholding the party's ideals and convictions. Marxism and communism come above all else. Marxism is the guiding thought of the party, and communism the lofty ideal. It was the conviction in Marxism and pursuit of the communist ideal that gave birth to the CPC and Chinese Socialism. When I was leading the work of drafting the report to the 18th CPC National Congress, I required the following addition. Communists' conviction in Marxism, Socialism, and Communism is their political soul that sustains them in all tests. We should never forget our origins and we must remain committed to our mission. Chinese communism has its origins in a belief in Marxism, communism, and Chinese socialism, and loyalty to the party and the people. We need to consolidate our convictions and loyalty. The torturous course of socialist practice across the world has shown that Marxist parties will collapse once they abandon their belief in Marxism, communism, and socialism. The lack or absence of ideals and convictions will result in moral weakness, which leads to political corruption, greed, moral degradation, and a decadent lifestyle. All party members must remain sober-minded about the ideals and convictions of the party. Whenever one is doubtful about one's observations and is an unsettled at heart, one cannot have a clear view of external things. When my doubts remain, I cannot have a clear judgment of right and wrong. Footnote 1. Shunzi. End of footnote 1. Party schools must make clear to the public their advocacy of Marxism, Communism, and Chinese Socialism, as well as the nature, tenets, traditions, and practice of the party. The party central committee's approval of establishing a school of Marxism under the central party school manifests the principle of upholding Marxism and Communism. Hostile forces at home and abroad constantly try to undermine our party. 
attempting to make us abandon our belief in Marxism, communism, and socialism. A number of people, even including some party members, cannot see the underlying dangers of accepting the universal values that have developed in the West over hundreds of years, along with certain Western political dogma. They argue we need not reject them since we would not suffer any significant harm by accepting them. Some even regard Western theories and discourse as the gold standard, and thus unconsciously become trumpeters of Western capitalist ideology. When it is uncertain whether something is right or wrong, we may make a judgment through past experiences and measure it against things of late. Footnote 2, Ibid. End of footnote 2. Since the end of the Cold War, some countries affected by Western values have been torn apart by war, or afflicted with chaos. If we tailor our practices to Western capitalist values, measure our national development by means of the Western capitalist evaluation system, and regard Western standards as the sole standards for development, the consequences will be devastating. We will have to follow others slavishly at every step, or we subject ourselves to their abuse. Party schools are not a paradise that is isolated from the real world. Students from across the country bring with them questions about all kinds of problems they have heard about or seen. Therefore, many major theoretical questions reach party schools, posing the task of enhancing theoretical research. Party schools should analyze all trends of thought and give proper guidance. They should not be bystanders. Furthermore, as a pioneering force in safeguarding Marxism and Chinese socialism, party schools should never hesitate to take a clear stance and resolve doubts and confusion. From the speech at the National Conference on Party Schools, December 11, 2015. Section 3. In the principle of identifying themselves with the party, Party schools should focus their efforts on the central tasks of the party and conduct solid research in the party's theories, helping consolidate the party's leadership of ideological work and Marxism as the guiding ideology in China. Only with a clear theoretical understanding of the major issues can party schools provide effective training. As the saying goes, Observation fosters clear understanding, listening fosters deeper comprehension, thinking fosters sound judgment. Footnote 3. Annotations by Wang Anshu in Scholar's Annotations to Dao De Jing. Dao De Jin Ji Ji Ju. Wang Anshi, 1021-1086, was a thinker, writer, and statesman of the Northern Song Dynasty. End of footnote 3. Today's society sees an increasing diversity of ideas and values, the coexistence of mainstream and non-mainstream theories, the mingling of progressive and outdated concepts, and a variety of new trends of thought. As I said, the publicity field can roughly be divided into red, gray, black, and gray areas. The red area is the domain where we have the initiative and must keep it. The black area is where we find malicious views in opposition to the party, so we must resolutely fight back and reduce their negative influence. The gray area is an intermediate zone that we must make an all-out effort to win over and turn into red. From the speech at the National Conference on Party Schools, December 11th, 2015. Section 4. The overwhelming majority of us can conscientiously and resolutely adhere to the guidance of Marxism, but there are some who fall short of thoroughly understanding Marxism, or effectively applying the Marxist stance, viewpoint, and method to produce high-quality works. 
They are not capable of building a system of disciplines, an academic system, and a discourse system guided by Marxism, and they have yet to produce meaningful results. Meanwhile, nebulous or erroneous notions still exist among certain people. Some think Marxism is obsolete and has already been abandoned in China, and some argue that Marxism is nothing but ideological teaching devoid of scientific principles or academic rigor. In practice, Marxism is marginalized, trivialized, and stereotyped in certain realms. It has disappeared from the textbooks in some fields of study and is no longer heard in academic discussions and debates. We must take these phenomena seriously. Even in Western countries today, Marxism still exerts great influence. At the turn of the century, Karl Marx was voted the greatest thinker of the millennium in a BBC poll. American economist Robert Hellbronner wrote in his book Marxism For and Against that we must look to Karl Marx for advice in exploring the future development of human society as it is still governed by the laws of development he expounded. Through the flux of time and progress in science, Marxism has testified to its strength as a body of scientific thought and its value in terms of truth and moral stature. Deng Xiaoping made the thoughtful observation, I am convinced that more and more people will come to believe in Marxism because it is a science. Footnote 4 Deng Xiaoping, excerpts from talks given in Wuchang, Shenzhen, Zhuhai, and Shanghai. Selected works of Deng Xiaoping, Volume 3, English Edition, Foreign Languages Press, Beijing, 1994, page 370. End of footnote 4. All people who work in China's philosophy and social science se sector should willingly follow the guidance of Marxism. Furthermore, they should conscientiously abide by the theories of Chinese socialism in their teaching and research. Cultivating a clear theoretical consciousness, firm political beliefs, and a scientific approach to thinking. From the speech at the seminar on philosophy and social sciences, May 17, 2016. Improve all aspects of the party's media leadership. February 19, 2016. Main points of the speech at the seminar on the party's media work. Publicity through media is an important responsibility of the CPC. It is of great significance to the governance and stability of the country. We should adapt to changes in the domestic and international situations and identify the role of media in the party's overall work. In this field, we must uphold the leadership of the party, keep the correct political orientation, maintain a people-centered work ethic, follow the rules of news dissemination, and develop innovative methods. In this way, can we effectively improve the coverage, guidance, and influence of the party's news media and increase its public trust? Over a long period of time, the major media under the CPC Central Committee have stood side by side with the party and the people and kept abreast of new developments. They have spread the truth of Marxism advocated the party's ideas and conveyed the people's voices, thereby playing a critical role in stages of revolution, reform, and development. They have promoted the general tenor of the 18th CPC National Congress in 2012 and the 3rd, 4th, and 5th plenary sessions of the CPC Central Committee in 2013, 2014, and 2015. They have highlighted the major decisions and plans of the CPC Central Committee and reported the activities and attitudes of the public, spreading mainstream values and positive energy. They have motivated party members and all Chinese people to work together for the Chinese dream of national rejuvenation. 
the party's publicity through media concerns, the nature and path of socialism, the implementation of the party's theories, lines, principles, and policies, the progress of all aspects of the party and the country's work, the cohesion between the party and the people and the bonds that link them, and the future of the party and the country. Therefore, we must steer our party's publicity through media based on the party's overall plans, give it full attention, and work out precise and effective measures to improve it. Right now, the party's media has the following responsibilities. Upholding socialism and guiding public opinion. Focusing on our major task and serving the overall interests of the country. Uniting the people and boosting morale. Fostering social morality and forging cohesion among the people. Refuting mistaken ideas and discerning between truth and falsehood, and connecting the country with the outside world. To fulfill this mission, we must keep to the right political orientation and take it as our top priority. Remain committed to the party spirit and principles. Adhere to the Marxist view of journalism. Maintain the right tone in guiding public opinion and put focus on positive publicity. To remain committed to the party spirit and principles, the fundamental prerequisite is the party's leadership over publicity. Media run by the party and the government are responsible for party and government publicity. They must therefore be led by the party. They must represent the party's will and advocacy. Safeguard the authority of the CPC Central Committee and the unity of the party, and love, protect, and serve the party. People working in the party's media must remain in alignment with the CPC Central Committee in political ideas and maintain a high level of accord in their thinking and actions. They should maintain that party spirit and the people's interests are integrated, lead the people, in conscientiously acting in accordance with the party's theories, lines, principles, and policies, reflect good experience created by the people and the actual problems they face, enrich their spiritual world and increase their mental strength. The view of journalism is the soul of news media. We should improve education on the Marxist view of journalism, encourage journalists to publicize the party's ideas and policies, record the changes of the times, promote social progress, and exercise public supervision for fairness and justice. We must maintain the right tone in all aspects of publicity. Party newspapers, periodicals, radio, and TV stations at all levels should follow this principle, as should local newspapers and periodicals and news media. News reports must follow this principle, as must supplements, features, and advertisements. Reports on politics and news must follow this principle, as must reports on leisure and society. Domestic news reports must follow this principle, as must international news reports. Maintaining unity and stability, boosting morale, and encouraging publicity that is primarily positive is the basic principle of the party's news media work. Positive publicity should be attractive and appealing. Truth is the lifeblood of news reports. Journalists should faithfully describe facts. They should accurately report individual events and tell the whole story. Public scrutiny through the mass media is consistent with promoting positive publicity. News media should face up to the problems in our work and social evils, eliminate vice, 
and exalt virtue and condemn unhealthy tendencies. Critical reports should also give accurate facts and objective analysis. As conditions evolve, the party's publicity must be innovative in concept, content, genre, form, methods, and means of news reporting, as well as in channels, systems, and mechanism of media operation, making news coverage more targeted, timely, and effective. The, party, the party's news media should be adapted to the trend of individualized and differentiated dissemination and create a new framework in guiding public opinion. We should advance integrated development by utilizing the advantages of new media communication. We should seize opportunities, keep good paces, and adopt sound strategies, and pay close attention to the ideal timing, extent, and impact of publicity. We should strengthen our ability to communicate with international audiences and have a stronger voice in the international community. We should find better ways to introduce China to the world, improve our foreign publicity strategies, and develop flagship media with greater international influence. The key to media competition is talent. The core of media strength is also talent. We should build a core of journalists equipped with firm political faith, suburb professionalism, a sound work ethic, and loyalty to the party and the people. Journalists must be politically minded, find their position in serving the overall interests of the country, be conscious of their social responsibilities, and keep reminding themselves whom they serve, whom they rely on, and who they are. Journalists should improve their expertise, learn more and meet more challenges, and strive to become well-rounded experts. They should improve their style of work and writing, be concentrated, observe realities, and speak truth with sincerity, so as to produce works with thought, warmth, and quality. Journalists should strengthen their self-discipline, cultivate their ethical qualities, and maintain personal integrity. For our part, we should reform the employment system in press institutes, trust journalists politically, give them the space to display their talent at work, concern ourselves with their lives, and ensure that they are rewarded for their work. Enhancing and improving the party's leadership over news media is the fundamental guarantee for the sound and healthy development of our publicity. Party committees at all levels should shoulder their political responsibility and exercise leadership. Leading officials should improve their ability to communicate with media and to advocate policies, solicit public opinion, identify social conflicts, guide public sentiment, mobilize the people, and improve their work. Let a healthy internet guide and reflect public opinion. April 19th, 2016 Part of the speech at the seminar on cybersecurity and IT application. As a broad social platform through which millions upon millions of users obtain and exchange information, the internet has a profound influence on the way people acquire knowledge, on the way they think, and also on their values and views. In particular, it influences the way that people view the country, society, their jobs, and also their lives. Attaining the two centenary goals requires that our entire society works with concerted efforts. It requires that all the people focus their thoughts and their efforts towards the same goal. A society that lacks common ideals, goals, and values, and that finds itself in disorder all the time, will never achieve success. For China, which has a population of more than 1.3 billion, disorder will benefit neither the people nor the country. Forming a consensus is no easy task, and so we all need to work harder. To attain our goals, 
we will need to form concentric circles both online and offline. What do I mean by concentric, concentric circles? I mean rallying all the people of China under the leadership of the CPC and motivating people of all walks of life to engage in a concerted effort to bring about the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. The ancients used to say, the person that knows a leaking roof is the one who is under that roof. The person that knows an error of the court is the one who is not in power. Footnote 1. Wang Chong. Discourses weighed in the balance. Lun Hung. Wang Chong, 27 to circa 97, was a historian of the Eastern Han Dynasty. End of footnote 1. If netizens are the grassroots, as many of them refer to themselves, then the Internet is today's grassroots platform. Netizens are members of the general public. If members of the public go online, so does public opinion. Our officials need to go wherever the public goes, otherwise how else are they expected to maintain ties with them? Party and government organizations and their leaders must learn to stay in touch with the people through the internet. They should go online regularly, observing, chatting, and posting their comments. They need to know what the people think and want, gather good ideas and suggestions, and actively respond to their concerns, answer their queries, and remove their doubts. Using the internet to understand public opinion and do their jobs is a basic skill that officials now need to learn. Officials of all ranks, particularly those in leading positions, must work constantly to improve their performance in this regard. The majority of netizens are ordinary people who come from different walks of life and have different life experiences. Their views and opinions are sure to vary greatly, and we cannot expect them to always be right about everything and correct in what they say. More tolerance and patience are therefore required. We need to promptly take constructive suggestions, afford assistance to those who need help, tell the truth to those in the dark, offer clarification to those who are confused about certain issues, help pacify those who bear a grudge against something, and guide those with erroneous views and correct their misunderstandings. This way, we will ensure that the Internet becomes a new platform through which we communicate and interact with the public, a new means through which we understand the people, stay in touch with them, and address their worries and difficulties, and a new channel through which we promote people's democracy and accept public scrutiny. Cyberspace is a common virtual home for millions of people. A clean and sound online environment is in the best interests of all users. Nobody wants to live in a space occupied by fraud, scams, attacks, slander, terror, obscenity, and violence. The internet cannot be a lawless place. The use of the internet to advocate the toppling of the government, preach religious extremism, or incite separatism and terrorism must be resolutely prevented and punished. Under absolutely no circumstances can such activities be allowed to go unchecked. The use of the internet to engage in fraud, circulate obscene materials, commit slander, and sell contraband goods cannot be left unchecked either. No country in the world would allow such activities to spiral out of control. Inspired by a sense of duty to society and the people, we must step up our law-based governance of cyberspace, develop better online content, strengthen positive publicity, and work to foster a positive, healthy, upright online culture. We need to use our core socialist values and profit from the best achievements of human civilization to nurture people's minds and nourish society, ensuring that positive energy and mainstream values prevail. By doing so, we will be able to create a clean and upright cyberspace 
for internet users, especially young ones. A sound atmosphere for the expression of opinion online does not imply that there should be only one voice and one tune. Rather, it means that people are not permitted to conflate right and wrong, circulate rumors, cause trouble, violate the law, or commit crime. It means that people cannot overstep the boundaries of the Constitution and other laws. I have repeatedly emphasized that power needs to be confined in the cage of regulations. An important means of doing this will be to exert the role of public scrutiny, including scrutiny on the Internet. Party and government organs and their leaders must take particular note of this point and make it their priority. We must not only welcome well-meant criticism and public oversight online, we must study it and take it into account, regardless of whether it is directed at the work of the party and government or at individual officials, and regardless of whether it is mild-mannered or unpleasant to hear. Develop Philosophy and Social Sciences with Chinese Features May 17, 2016 Part of the Speech at the Seminar on Philosophy and Social Sciences The distinctive feature and style of a country's philosophy and social sciences is the result of development at a certain stage, and therefore a symbol of its maturity, strength, and self-confidence. In the field of philosophy and social sciences in the world of today, China ranks high in the number of researchers and theses, and in government input. However, our standing in the areas of academic ideas, thoughts, viewpoints, and standards, and our voice in international academia are still incommensurate with our level of national strength and international status. To change this situation, we must develop our philosophy and social sciences that are grounded in Chinese conditions, learn from other countries, show humanistic care, research into history, focus on the present, and look into the future. They should display sal salient Chinese features and style in such areas as guiding principles, range of disciplines, academic system, and discourse system. What should philosophy and social sciences with Chinese features be like? In my view, they bear three hallmarks. First, they encompass all resources and legacies and retain their Chinese identity. The status of philosophy and social sciences is the result of a confluence of different learning, conceptions, theories, and methods throughout history. Our philosophy and social sciences should therefore make the best of various resources, ancient and modern, Chinese and foreign, especially the following three. 1. Marxist resources. These include axioms of Marxism, the achievements of adapting Marxism to the Chinese context and its cultural manifestations, the CPC theories, guidelines, principles, and policies, the path theoretical systems and institutions of Chinese socialism, and thoughts and achievements in philosophy and social sciences concerning China's economy, politics, laws, culture, society, eco-environment, diplomacy, national defense, and the CPC development. These constitute the primary substance of philosophy and social sciences of Chinese features. They are also the fastest growing areas in Chinese philosophy and social sciences. 2. The best of traditional Chinese culture, a valuable resource for the development of philosophy and social sciences with Chinese features. 3. The philosophy and social sciences of other countries, including all the wholesome results of studies worldwide which provide the required nourishment for philosophy and social sciences with Chinese features. We should make the past serve the present and the foreign serve China, rallying all resources available to make ceaseless innovations to our knowledge, theories, and methods. We should learn from other countries and look into the future without foregoing our own history and heritage. Internally, we should conduct thorough research on key issues bearing on the national economy and standards of living. Externally, we should actively explore major issues concerning the future of humanity. 
we must make a precise assessment of the development trends of Chinese socialism, inheriting and carrying forward the best of traditional Chinese culture. The splendid Chinese culture that spans thousands of years offers fertile soil for the growth of philosophy and social sciences with Chinese features. As I have said on other occasions, backed by a territory of 9.6 million square kilometers, rich cultural nutrients amassed over the long course of strenuous endeavors and the formidable strength of a united people of 1.3 billion. China can follow its own path with great determination, with boundless horizons ahead and a peerless civilization behind it. We Chinese people, each and every one of us, should be confident of this. Our confidence in our path, in our theories, and in our system all boil down to our confidence in our culture, the essential underlying and enduring strength of of a nation. It has been proved in both this and previous times that a people who renounce or betray their history and culture can in no way achieve development and what is worse may face tragic consequences. The rich cultural traditions and system of thought with indigenous features embody the knowledge, wisdom, and rational thinking Chinese people have garnered over millennia. They give us an unparalleled strength. The Chinese civilization carries on the spiritual, ethical lineage of the Chinese nation and its people. It must be passed down from generation to generation, keep abreast of the times through innovation, and get rid, get rid of the stale and bring forth the fresh. We should make greater efforts to find and expound the best elements of traditional Chinese culture, acclimating core cultural genes of the Chinese people to contemporary culture and modern society, and promoting those cultural elements whose lasting appeal defies time and borders, and which are still relevant today. We should push forward the innovative transformation and creative evolution of China's civilization to boost its vitality so that it can provide proper guidance to humanity together with other splendid civilizations. We should put forward concepts, proposals, and programs about major issues facing China and the rest of the world that give expression to the Chinese stance, Chinese wisdom, and Chinese values. In addition to Chinese delicacies as shown in the well-received documentary A Bite of China, we should also introduce to the rest of the world China's academia, theories, and philosophy, and social sciences, projecting the image of a China in progress, an open China, and a China making a constant contribution to human civilization. While highlighting the national identity of our philosophy and social sciences, we do not mean to reject the research results of other countries. Instead, we should make comparative and critical analysis before absorbing and extending them, so that Chinese philosophy and social sciences can better respond to the current demands of national and international development. Anything unique to one nation is of great significance to the rest of the world. Only after solving national problems will we be in a better position to solve international problems, and by reviewing domestic practices, we will develop a greater ability to offer suggestions and solutions for global issues. This is the law of evolution from particularity to universality. Chinese philosophy and social sciences should be based on national conditions, and meanwhile open themselves to the rest of the world, drawing from the good theories, ideas, and intellectual achievements of all humanity. But we cannot enshrine any of these theories, ideas, or intellectual achievements as the one and only criterion, or attempt to transform the world with a single mode, otherwise we will slip into the mire of mechanism. Certain theories, ideas, and intellectual achievements denote the course of development of certain countries and peoples, and make sense in the context of a particular region, culture, or history. It is ludicrous to force 
them on all countries and peoples, or use them to pass judgment on people's lives and reduce them to one format. We must analyze and assess foreign theories, concepts, assertions, and methods, taking in what suits us and discarding what does not. Philosophy and social science researchers must adopt a critical attitude, the most valued quality of Marxism. Philosophy and social sciences have a broad sphere, covering varied disciplines, each of, each of which has its own learning system and research method. We should study all learning systems and research methods and learn from the good ones rather than rejecting them, indiscriminately, without conducting any analysis. Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels drew extensively on the creations of those who preceded them in the course of establishing their own theoretical systems. We, too, should make good use of the worthy learning systems and effective methods of modern science, including such models as deduction and quantitative analysis. But in doing so, we must be mindful of our roots and maintain good judgment. Capital by Marx on Imperialism by Vladimir Lenin and the series of investigative reports on rural China by Mao Zedong all contain a large volume of statistics and information collected through field studies. We must stand by the Chinese worldview and Chinese methodology when solving domestic problems and proposing to address issues concerning all humanity. Blindly worshipping foreign thoughts and methods without due analysis will deprive us of originality, as will drawing the same conclusions as foreign researchers by employing their methods. To achieve original results, Chinese researchers must ground themselves in the reality of China, cleave to the practical, historical, dialectic, and developmental perspectives, and discover, test, and advance truth through practice. Second, philosophy and social sciences with Chinese features must display originality and zeitgeist. Mindlessly imitating others cannot lead us to philosophy and social sciences adapted to our own conditions or solutions for our own problems. Mao Zedong remarked back in 1944, Our attitude is that of critical acceptance of our own historical heritage and of foreign thought. We are against blind acceptance as well as blind rejection of any ideas. We Chinese must think with our own brains and must decide for ourselves what can grow on our own soil. Footnote 1. Mao Zedong, Interview with Journalist Gunther Stein. Collected Works of Mao Zedong, Volume 3, Chinese Edition, People's Publishing House, Beijing, 1996, page 192, end of footnote 1. We must put forward subjective, original theories and views on the basis of studying Chinese conditions and construct disciplinary, academic, and discourse systems with our own features. This is the only way for Chinese philosophy and social sciences to develop independent properties and strengths. The life of a theory lies in innovation, which is the perpetual theme of the development of philosophy and social sciences and requisite of social, practical, and historical progress. As human society continues to evolve, new circumstances and new problems arise. Some of them can be tackled with existing experience and approaches. Others cannot. Without the creation and application of new thoughts, concepts, and methods through timely study, theories will be impotent in the face of reality, and philosophy and social sciences will be lame and flaccid. Innovation in philosophy and social sciences can come in many forms. It could mean discovering a rule, founding a school of thought, illustrating a truth, or finding a solution to a specific problem. Where theoretical thinking starts decides what results will be achieved, and all theoretical innovations start with specific problems. The course of theoretical innovation is, in a sense, the course of identifying, winnowing, researching, and eventually solving problems. Karl Marx wrote insightfully, The question, not the answer, constitutes the main difficulty. The questions are the voice of the time. 
they the supremely practical utterance, proclaiming the state of its soul. Footnote 2. Karl Marx, the question of centralization in itself, and with regard to the supplement to number 137 of the Rheinstieck Zittung, Tuesday, May 17, 1842. Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, Collected Works, Volume 1, English Edition, Lawrence and Wishart, Electric Book, 2010, page 182, end of footnote 2. I have read many classics of philosophy and social sciences. Among them are Politeia by Plato, Politics by Aristotle, Utopia by Thomas More, City of the Sun by Tommaso Campanella, Two Treatises of Government by John Locke, The Spirit of the Laws by Montesquieu, The Social Contract by John Jacques Rousseau, Federalist Papers by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay, Elements of the Philosophy of Right by Hegel, On War by Clausewitz, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith, An Essay on the Principle of Population by Malthus, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money by Keynes, Theory of Economic Development by Joseph Schumpeter, Economics by Paul Samuelson, Capitalism and Freedom by Milton Friedman, and Economic Growth of Nations by Simon Kuznets. Footnotes 3 through 19. Plato, 427 to 347 BC, was a philosopher of ancient Greece. Aristotle, 384 to 322 BC, was a philosopher and scientist of ancient Greece. Thomas More, 1478 to 1535, was a British statesman and humanist. Tommaso Campanella, 1568 to 1639, was an Italian philosopher, poet, and literature. John Locke, 1632 to 1704, was a British philosopher. Montesquieu, 1689 to 1755, was a French Enlightenment thinker and lawyer. John Jacques Rousseau, 1712 to 1778, was a French Enlightenment thinker, philosopher, educator, and man of letters. Alexander Hamilton, 1755 or 1757 to 1804, was a political activist in the early period of the United States. Hegel, 1770 to 1831, was a German philosopher. Karl von Clausewitz, 1780 to 1831, was a German military theorist. Adam Smith, 1723 to 1790, was a British philosopher. Thomas Malthus, 1766 to 1834, was a British economist. Keynes, 1883 to 1946, was a British economist. Joseph Schumpeter, 1883 to 1950, was an Austrian-born American economist. Paul Samuelson, 1915 to 2009, was an American economist. Milton Friedman, 1912 to 2006, was an American economist. Simon Kuznets, 1901 to 1985, was a Russo-American economist. End of footnotes 3 through 19. My impression is that they are unexceptionally the product of their times and the result of pondering over and delving into prominent conflicts and problems of a given society at a given time. Since the start of reform and opening up China has persevered in theoretical innovation, correctly answering such critical questions as what is socialism, how to build socialism, what kind of party should the CPC be, how to build the CPC, and what kind of development should we pursue, and how can we achieve it. We have continuously put forward new theories in light of new practices which provide us with scientific guidance in formulating policies and advancing our work. The conceptions and theories of originality and zeitgeist that China has produced in the past years include those on modernizing its governance system and capacity for governance, developing the socialist market economy, socialist democratic politics, and socialist consultative democracy, constructing a socialist legal system with Chinese features, promoting an advanced socialist culture, nurturing and implementing the core socialist values, building a harmonious socialist society, a healthy eco-environment, and a new and open economic system, implementing an overall national security strategy, 
forging a community of shared future for mankind, advancing the initiative of the Silk Road Economic Belt and the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road, upholding the greater good and pursuing shared interests, strengthening the party's governance capacity, following the Chinese path to build stronger armed forces, and meeting the party's goals for the army in the current era. China's philosophy and social science sector has made a significant contribution to these conceptions and theories, and achieved incomparable competitive edge in the process. The sweeping social changes that China is undergoing are not simply the extension of China's historical and cultural experiences, the repetition of socialist practices by other countries, or the duplication of modernization endeavors elsewhere nor can they be readily slotted into the template devised by earlier writers of Marxist classics. Thus, there is no textbook of predetermined solutions to which we can turn. Chinese philosophy and social sciences should focus on the country's current undertakings and delve into China's experience of reform and development to forage for new materials, identify new problems, create new ideas, and found new theories. At the same time, it should make greater efforts to systematically review the practical experience China has garnered in its reform, opening up, and building socialist modernization to analyze and study such major issues as those concerning socialist market economy, democratic politics, advanced culture, harmonious society, the eco-environment, and the sea and the CPC's governance capacity, and to canvas and expound new concepts, new ideas, and new strategies about governance raised by the CPC Central Committee. In doing so, it is expected to produce new theories based on scientific rationale and new practices of regular methods. These are the focus and priority of building Chinese philosophy and social sciences. Any approach that ignores changing circumstances or mechanically imitates others will lead us up a blind alley. Third, philosophy and social sciences with Chinese features must be systematic and professional. It should cover history, economy, politics, culture, society, eco-environment, the military, and party development, and span traditional subjects, emerging subjects, leading-edge subjects, interdisciplinary subjects, and less popular subjects as well. These are expected to evolve into an all-encompassing system of learning by continuously improving and innovating the primary disciplinary system, academic system, and discourse system. To date, Chinese philosophy and social sciences have established their primary disciplinary system, but some pressing issues still exist. For instance, certain subjects have nothing much to do with social development. The primary disciplinary system is incomplete, and emerging and interdisciplinary subjects are still weak. What we should do next is therefore to build on our strengths, extend our fields of study, address our weaknesses, and generally improve the primary disciplinary system. For this goal, we should first strengthen Marxist subjects. Second, we should further improve pillar subjects, including philosophy, history, economics, political science, science of law, sociology, ethnology, journalism, demography, study of religions, and psychology. Establishing a primary discipline system, disciplinary system with Chinese features and international significance. Third, we should pay great attention to important subjects in which we are strong. Fourth, we should give priority to emerging and interdisciplinary subjects of real practical significance, which offer potential for breakthroughs in Chinese philosophy and social sciences as a whole. Fifth, we should not neglect more marginal subjects that are of high cultural value or bear on Chinese heritage. These subjects may seem distant from the everyday life of today, but they are nonetheless relevant. As the Chinese saying goes, a country maintains its army for thousands of days for use in a single day's battle. When in need, they can be readily used. Some subjects bear on the continuity of China's cultural heritage, such as the study of oracle bone inscriptions and other ancient scripts. We should treat these subjects seriously and make sure that there are people working on them, carrying them on from one generation to another. 
In summary, we should endeavor to foster a philosophy and social science sector where the basic subjects are sound and complete, where we have a clear competitive edge in key subjects, where emerging and interdisciplinary subjects evolve creatively, where less popular subjects are given due academic attention from generation to generation, where basic research and applied research complement each other, and where academic research and application of research results are mutually reinforcing. The disciplinary system is inseparable from the textbook system, and in terms of level of development, they are interdependent. Studies show that almost all Chinese universities offer philosophy and social science programs at the undergraduate level, and students majoring in liberal arts account for a significant share of the total enrollment. These students are the reserve forces for Chinese philosophy and social sciences. They, however, cannot fulfill the mission if they fail to form the right worldview and methodology or to lay down a solid intellectual foundation in their school years. Higher education programs of philosophy and social sciences bear responsibility to foster people of high caliber. They should reach out to all students, helping them foster a sound worldview and outlook on life and values, a noble mind, a strong moral character, and scientific thinking so that they can grow healthy in mind, body, and personality. Good textbooks are essential to the cultivation of future philosophy and social science professionals. China has made remarkable headway in this regard in the course of studying and advancing Marxist theories, but our textbook system as a whole is still weak. More has to be done to enable it to render stronger support to the development of Chinese socialism, move to the forefront of global academia, and establish a complete range of categories. To this end, mechanisms and institutional innovations should be introduced into the compilation, distribution, and application of textbooks, bringing into play the initiative of all parties concerned, including academics, schools, and publishers. A stronger discourse system is also needed for Chinese philosophy and social sciences to play their dual role. We should have more say than anyone else when constructing construing Chinese practices and constructing Chinese theories. The truth is, however, that our voice is still weak on the international stage when it comes to philosophy and social sciences, due to our inability to make potent arguments and reach broader audiences. To remedy this shortcoming, we must hone our skills in formulating iconic concepts and creating new concepts, domains, and expressions that can be readily understood and accepted by the international community, thereby inclining international academics into relevant research and discussions. Efforts in this regard must start with establishing systematic theories and concepts in every discipline. We must also encourage research institutions of philosophy and social sciences to join and found international academic organizations, support the establishment of Chinese research centers abroad, and encourage research by foreign associations and foundations on Chinese issues. Furthermore, we will promote exchanges between Chinese think tanks and their foreign peers and encourage China studies in other countries. China's philosophy and social science sector should expand its international influence by focusing on issues of global concern and initiating and leading relevant research projects. It should also put more effort into incubating excellent foreign language academic websites and journals and help to introduce the accomplishments of Chinese researchers to the rest of the world, supporting their participation in international seminars and publication of their research papers. Fostering philosophy and social sciences with Chinese features is a systematic project and an arduous task that requires good top-level design and coordinated efforts by all parties concerned. We should launch innovation programs and establish innovation platforms and promote innovation in all domains of philosophy and social sciences. We should intensify and expand the research, promulgation, and education of Marxist theories by giving full play to research and development programs in Marxist theory. 
to centers of research into Chinese socialist theories, to academies of Marxism, and to newspapers, periodicals, websites, and other platforms for ideological and theoretical work. Furthermore, Internet and big data should be employed to upgrade IT infrastructure and applications in the philosophy and social science sector in such fields as books, dossiers, websites, and databases. Construction of the National Center for Literature on Philosophy and Social Sciences should be accelerated and an efficient and accessible digital platform for philosophy and social science studies should be created, allowing for sharing of resources. The systems for the distribution, grant, and management of research funding should be innovated so as to ensure better use of funds. This includes increasing input, making efficient use of funds by teaming up financial fiscal appropriation with specific allocation, generic funding with competitive funding, and government grants with public donations. Meanwhile, an authoritative and transparent evaluation system and a promotion system should be installed to effectively identify and disseminate good research results.